couple of reminders in case you need them a week from today is your third quiz and for the final exam if you are do, I, there are about 40 people signed up for the early final so i'm okay with that so you know we'll we'll i'll track it because i have a room big enough to do it but clearly if you feel you're going to be ready on the 8th it's your choice right so I don't know whether any of you had a chance to do the optimal debt ratio of your company. Anybody ever had a chance? Justin? Yeah. Don't match up. You really don't. I mean, it might actually, so your current cost of capital is going to be computed. You, did everybody get Justin's point, which is in the spreadsheet, I compute the optimal, the rating at every debt ratio using the interest coverage ratio. So let's say you're at a 30% debt ratio. I compute the interest coverage ratio. I come up with the rating. But if you have an actual rating, it might not match up most of the time. Is your rating higher or lower? Lower than the estimate? Which one's lower, the one that's estimated in the spreadsheet or the one that you have? The spreadsheet was higher. Yeah. So the first question is why, why am I, usually it's the other way around. Usually the spreadsheet gives a lower rating because I refinance all your debt at the current market interest rate, which you don't have to. If you're a company, you might have debt, which is old debt at low rates. So the fact that's happening suggests that the ratings agency is seeing something in the operating income that you're not bringing into the spreadsheet. Okay, so one of the things you might look at is a history of operating income. See if, in fact, there's enough there that might lead you to use an average operating income over time rather than the current operating income. But that's, I think, something that can be resolved at the end because, you know, otherwise you'll give them too high an optimal debt ratio. You know? Anybody else? Anybody else have a chance to do their optimal debt ratio? Yes. First, tell me the company you're doing it on. Okay. Debt. Let's say debt to cap. So debt to cap, or okay, seven percent. That's including leases. They have only seven percent debt. Okay. Okay. First, remember, I jumped 0, 10, 20, right? So if you told me that you were at 17 and the optimal is 20, my conclusion is you're pretty close to your optimal, right? Because 20 would be at 7, it looks like they're under levered. And today we'll talk about what to do next. But you might decide you're under levered, stay under levered because of who they are. Now, who they are is a brick and mortar retail company. They're one of the success stories among brick and mortar retailing, but you don't want to put that at risk. So today we'll talk about what to do once you get the optimal. So let's start, when you run that spreadsheet, one of the things it'll do is get you caught up. In what sense? If you haven't even looked at your company's beta, cost of equity, ratings, cost of capital, when you do the optimal capital structure spreadsheet, it's a one shot. Basically, everything gets updated to those numbers. So it'll get you caught up on much of the project. 
It'll also compute the change in firm value by taking the change in the cost of capital, computing an annual savings, and taking the present value of those savings. It'll tell you how much your value per share will go up or down if you go to the optimal. You're saying, why would it go down if it goes to the optimal? Remember the 17 versus 20% example? You might actually end up with a lower cost of capital at 17% than my computed optimal at 20 simply because I'm taking 10% increments. Just leave it as is. Don't try to refine it and go in 1% increments, even though you can. You know, you don't want to create false precision here. You're getting a rough sense of what the optimal is. So that's a cost of capital approach and the enhanced cost of capital approach. In both cases, it's the cost of capital that drives how we think about optimal debt ratios. Early in this class, Early in this class, I talked about the adjusted present value approach. Adjusted present value approach was developed out of the University of Chicago, perhaps in the late, late 70s, early 80s, as an alternative to the cost of capital approach. I'm gonna describe the adjusted present value approach. I'm gonna talk about why I don't use it in practice, and why most of the people who use it in practice are actually not doing it fully. They take it part way through, and you're gonna see the part that they don't do it. So let's look at the adjusted present value approach. The adjusted present value approach, rather than looking at the effect on the cost of capital of changing your debt ratio, you start by estimating what the value of your company would be with no debt. Let's call that the unlevered firm value. You're saying, how the heck are we gonna do that? I'll give you two, two ways you can get there. And one is actually based on the current market cap. You can back into an unlevered firm value. Second stop, you estimate the tax benefits you're going to get from debt. Remember we said that's the big benefit, right? Which is the tax rate. So we'll talk about the, you know, what that adds to value. And then to complete the process, we subtract out the biggest downside of debt, which is you increase your risk of bankruptcy and expected bankruptcy costs. So at every debt level, instead of computing the cost of capital, I compute the levered firm value by bringing in the tax benefits and the expected bankruptcy costs. You can already see that as I borrow money, the tax benefits exceed the expected bankruptcy costs that's going to push up value. But there will be a tipping point where the expected bankruptcy costs will start to get higher than the tax benefits. And that's when you've kind of hit your cap on debt. Now, of course, there are mechanics here. Let's look at the mechanics of getting each of these steps. Let's start with the unlevered firm value. There's a long way of getting there. We haven't done valuation yet, but you can value a company, I said, by taking the present value of its free cash flow to the firm, cash flows before debt payments, and discounting at the cost of capital. If you have no debt, what will your cost of capital become? Not just the cost of equity, but the cost of equity based on what kind of beta? an unlevered beta. So you take the unlevered beta, you plug it in, you get a cost of equity, that becomes your cost of capital, you value the firm with that cost of capital. You're saying, that sounds easy enough, but you have to still estimate cash flows in the future. It's a full-fledged valuation with the unlevered beta and the cost of equity. That's a long way. There's a short way. You know the market cap today, right? The market cap today reflects the unlevered firm value and the effects of whatever debt they have right now. What if I could take out the effects of the debt? In the APV approach to take out the effect of the debt, what do I need to do? What's a big, what's a big plus that'll be gone if I pay off the debt? My tax benefits. So I'm gonna subtract out the tax benefits from existing debt and the savings will be the reduction in bankruptcy costs. So I'm gonna add that back and say, this is what your value would be as an unlevered firm value. I strongly recommend when you do the APV approach that you use the latter approach because that way you're not doing some firm valuation that's giving you a different number. You're keeping the market gap and reversing into an unlevered firm value. So that can be done and the mechanics are ready. The tax benefits of debt are relatively simple. What is, what's the tax benefit of debt? If you boil it down to basics, what, what is the dollar? So if I had $100 million in interest expenses, What's the tax benefit I get? This times the tax rate, right? If you have a 25% tax rate, I've saved 25 million in taxes. So the present value of tax benefits from debt is the present value of the tax savings you're going to get from interest expenses forever. And the forever actually helps you out here. 
if in fact you get a hundred million dollars in interest expenses every year forever, and you save 25 million every year forever, the present value of that 25 million forever becomes the present value of perpetuity. How do we get the present value of perpetuity? You take the 25 million and you divide it by your discount rate, which in this case actually has to be the cost of debt because the risk you're talking about is the risk in those cash flows. It turns out that that'll give you a shortcut where the dollar debt that you take on, so if you take on a billion dollars in debt, the tax benefits will be the tax rate times the dollar debt. When people first look at this, they say, but only the interest expense are tax deductible. You're right. But the present value of interest expenses in perpetuity gives me the tax rate times my dollar debt. So the unlevered firm value is doable. The tax benefits from debt are trivial, easy to calculate. And then you get the expected bankruptcy cost. And you've just entered the dark zone. And here's what. To estimate the expected bankruptcy cost, I need two numbers. I need a probability of bankruptcy. And I need a bankruptcy cost as a percentage of value. What will, what will it cost me if people either perceive me as going bankrupt or actually go bankrupt? That expected, that bankruptcy cost is where most people give up. So here's what happens when people use the APV approach in practice. They do the unlevered firm value. They get the tax benefits of debt. Then they get to the expected bankruptcy cost and they start wringing their answer. This is so difficult. And there are so many assumptions to be made. So we'll just ignore it. Let me put this on the table. Ignoring something is an assumption. People do this all the time. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to ignore it. Because when you ignore something, what are you essentially assuming the expected bankruptcy cost to be? Zero. And let's carry this to fruition. If you get the tax benefits of debt and there are no expected bankruptcy costs, how much should you borrow? 99%. Now do you see why LBO guys like the APV approach? It always them, you're doing amazing stuff. Because you can borrow money. And the more money you borrow, your value goes up. To do this right, you need to do all three. And while I don't do the APV approach, I'll give you the template for doing it. And if anybody ends up arguing and say, I don't like the cost of capital approach, I want to do the take them through the entire process, see if they still want to go with the APV approach. So let's talk about this, this third element, the expected bankruptcy. Two elements needed, right? One is the probability of bankruptcy. So you got to tell me as your debt goes up, what is the likelihood that you will go bankrupt? Here's what I'm going to do to estimate that. Remember how we estimated a synthetic rating in the cost of capital approach at every debt ratio based on the interest coverage ratio? There we estimated the rating because we wanted a default spread. But if you can estimate a rating, ratings also go with probabilities of default. Because we have a history, 100 years of companies being rated, and if you go back over the 100 years, you can estimate what the likelihood is that a triple B, a double B, a single B, a, you know, a triple C bond will default over the next 10 years. Ed Altman, who taught fixed income here for, for decades, used to update that table every year as part of a research paper that Merrill, and you know, that ended up, Merrill Lynch took that over. But now both S&P and Moody's, if you go to their website, give you this number on an updated basis every year, the likelihood of default. So that's what I'm gonna do at every debt ratio. I'm gonna estimate the probability of default based on your rating, your synthetic rating as a company. The bankruptcy cause is the weakest link in this calculation. Remember what this is. This is the percentage of value that you will lose either because you go bankrupt. Let's call it the direct cost of bankruptcy. The legal system eats away your money. That's fairly straightforward. It's about 5 to 10% of value based on research. But the indirect bankruptcy cause is what happens to you when people think you might be in trouble. That number could be very low for a grocery store, very high for an that number can be anywhere from an extra 10% to an extra 30%. And, and getting a clear sense of what that number is, nobody's really been able to nail it down. Why? Because it's unobservable, right? How do you observe the customer who walks into a store and doesn't buy your stuff because you're in trouble? Because of that, people just wave their hands. I can't afford to do that in the APV approach. I've got to make a judgment. But here's the way to think about it. 
A low number for bankruptcy cost will be about 10% of value. A high number can be as high as 40 to 50% of value. Most companies will fall between 20 and 30% of value. So with that in place, let's talk about getting these numbers for Disney. I'm going to lead in with a table. This was the table in 2013. That time, Ed, Ed was one of the few people who was updating this table. That's a percentage of default in the 10 years after a bond is issued. So the way this table is created is going back and looking at history at bonds issued 10 years ago, looking at what percentage defaulted over the last 10 years. So these are not projections for the future. These are based on the past, and you're extrapolating from the past. So if you're a AAA rated company, there's a 0.07% chance you will default sometime over the next 10 years. So you know what happens, right? You start as AAA rated in year zero, there's 0.07% of chances you something terrible happens to you and you essentially collapse sometime over the next 10 years, but it's very low. As the rating decreases, you can see the likelihood of default increasing. And by the time you get to triple C, 59% of triple C rated bonds default within 10 years of being issued. This is the table that I'm going to use to estimate the likelihood of default at every debt ratio. Okay. Any questions on this likelihood of default table? Okay. So let's take Disney and first compute the unlevered firm value. We know the value of the firm right now. That's the market value of equity plus the market value of debt. Gives me a total value of 137.9 billion. That is the existing total value for Disney as a company. It reflects the fact that they have 15.96 billion in debt. So let's play a game. Let's assume you take that debt out. You go from 15.96 to zero. You're going to lose the tax benefits on that debt. And remember the shortcut, you multiply the tax rate by the dollar debt. That 5,762 is now gone because you paid off the debt. But you save yourself the fact that there was a small bankruptcy risk. It wasn't large because the debt level was low. 0.66% was the likelihood of default. That is now gone because they paid off the debt as well. So because you paid off the debt, you lose the tax benefits. You gain back the fact that you have 0.66% chance default is now gone. I, I, I assumed, and I'll be quite honest, I just made up this number somewhere between the 10 and the 40. I said, it's not Boeing. It's not Kroger. I'm going to put it in the middle. But remember, I didn't want to use this approach in the first place. So if somebody makes a big deal about APV, throw this back in their lap and say, if you can find a better way of estimating it, come up with it. So I've added that back. So I want to make sure everybody gets what I'm doing here. I'm removing the debt and when I remove the debt, I lose the tax benefits, but I save myself that expected bankruptcy cost. My unlevered firm value is $132.3 billion. You're saying, what does that mean? Based on this calculation, if Disney paid off all its existing debt and became an all-equity funded firm, its value is going to be $132 billion. That's the unlevered firm value. I've got item one in the APV calculated. That's the unlevered firm value. Any questions on this? Yes, Zach. It's because specific approaches to what? The unlevered firm value or, okay. There are only two, right? This, or you can do it the long way, which is to estimate the cash flows discount back at the co at the unlevered cost of equity. Uh, for the um, different approaches, um, we were talking about, yeah, like what we were talking about before today, like uh, not what we're talking about, so outside of the scope of this specifically, the, the uh, Okay, so we're talking about different approaches to doing what? Computing an optimal or different? Okay. So we looked at cost of capital. We looked at enhanced cost of capital. We looked at, no. So there are different ways of thinking about the optimal. Yeah. But if you have a company and you know what their current debt equity ratio is right now, right. is there? Uh, that, that you'll always know. Right, so that's got nothing to do with the approaches. So the existing debt ratio. Can you like gut check which approach is best to determine? Mm -hmm. No, there's no. If I mean, if our guts were so good, we wouldn't be doing any of this stuff, right? I mean, none of us are those kinds of savants who can look at a company and say, "Oh, the optimal for this." The whole reason for doing this is you don't want to trust your gut, right? Because otherwise, you know what drives your gut is our frames of reference. Frames of reference basically mean we look at a number and say, that looks high, that looks low. You know, that 
unfortunately is not a great way to think about it. Unfortunately, but unfortunately, there are people out there, consultants and bankers who go around with gut feeling. You know, you look like you have too much debt. How do you know? It's gut. Never trust your gut, right? Because your gut can tell you things about a company that really don't reflect what's up. So I, if, if you're going to do an approach, just do the cost of capital approach. After all, you had to do it to get a hurdle rate. It's an approach that's already in front of you. It's an approach that people can relate to. The other approaches are approaches which finesse, right? The enhance your APV. So I would say at the minimum, do the cost of capital approach because it's something you need anyway. I don't think it's super robust. It just makes us feel more comfortable. Let's be quite honest, because every approach has estimates. They're all noisy and they're all conditioned on operating income changing dramatically the next year. All it does, it gives you more comfort that the conclusion you come up with is not that sensitive to using different approaches. Right? So that's my unlevered firm value. Now I'm ready to compute what my optimal debt ratio of the APV approach. So my debt ratio goes from zero to 90%, the dollar debt at every debt ratio, exactly the same way I did debt in my cost of capital. So it's a debt, debt ratio times the total value of the firm. There's my tax rate, 36.1%, my marginal tax rate. And re remember that it decreases after 70%, not because of some magical good things happening to me, but because I run out of, uh, of taxable income. So my tax rate decreases. There's my unlevered firm value. It stays exactly the same. It can't change as the debt ratio changes. There's my expected tax benefits. And you can see the expected tax benefits are essentially a function of the dollar debt and the tax rate. And again, after 70%, I run into problems. I'm just having trouble keeping those tax benefits going. My bond rating, my synthetic rating comes from the interest coverage ratio, exactly the same approach that I used to compute my cost of capital, but now I'm using it to estimate by property of default. So when Disney has zero debt, or in fact, all the way through 20%, their chance of default is almost zero. But as they keep pushing their debt up, the chance of default increases. So by the time you do an LBO of Disney, you're looking at an 85% chance of default. The expected bankruptcy cost comes from that property of default times that 25% of value. And you can see it climbs as you go from. So my ultimate firm value is the unlevered firm value plus the tax benefits, my unexpected bankruptcy costs. And you can see initially debt helps me. The tax benefits exceed the expected bankruptcy costs. And magically and luckily I end up with an optimal debt ratio of 40%, which happened to be the optimal debt ratio with your cost of capital approach. Is everybody clear? Yes, go ahead. It's, in fact, people with APV, the magical manipulation is they use zero, right? That is the worst manipulation of all because you're essentially assuming no bankruptcy cost. I wish they actually put a number, even a manipulated number, because at least you can then debate that number looks high or low. They just act like it's not there. Okay? APV is unlevered firm value plus tax benefit. And you ask them, where's the expected bankruptcy cost? And the reaction is what? They've forgotten there's an expected bankruptcy cost because they're so used to just stopping after the tax benefits. Well, this, the question is who's making the decision, right? In a company, who makes a debt ratio decision? It's a top management. Who's advising them? Consultants and bankers, right? Analysts don't enter the picture, right? They're outsiders, but consultants and bankers. And they're advising them and say, if you do this, your value will go up. And if you're using the APV approach, your value will always look at, like it's going to go up as you borrow more money. Have you been reading the strange but horrible story of Thames Water in the UK? If you get a chance, read it. It's a utility that essentially borrowed too much and is now blowing up. And as a utility, the government's saying, what do we do now? Because you still need the utility to provide water to, you know. So that's a company that borrowed. And people say, how did that happen? Okay. 
And I'll wager that somewhere along the way, somebody forgot all about expected bankruptcy costs. And Nate, you know, the world has a nasty way of reminding you when you forget about expected bankruptcy costs, that just because you assumed it away, doesn't mean it's gone away. Okay. I absolutely, the, the, the reason that old regulated utilities were able to do this was cost plus pricing. As long as you have cost plus pricing, you can borrow a lot and still get away with it. Because what you do is you take your interest expense, you make it a cost, and then you say your power. But once you get pushed back on how much you can raise power prices, then you got to be careful about how much you borrow because it's no longer cost plus pricing. And that's what's changed in the regulated utility business is they're now facing competition from other unregulated entities that can offer power at a lower rate. They've lost, they lost some pricing power and that's showing up in the utilities having too much debt. Yes. Just, it seems that you get 80% of the way there to the actual value of the firm, and then they decide. No, no, you go to 120% of the value. That's the problem, right? You're overshooting. Because remember, the expected bankruptcy cost is never a plus. It's always a minus. So you're not going to get 80%. You're going to get to 120% of value before you adjust for the expected bankruptcy cost. Yeah. I feel like you process, you get 80% of the way there to the very end of it. And yeah. I choose to use, right? They don't even use it because they don't have a property. They don't use it at all, right? Because if you ignore expected bankruptcy costs, it's not there. My point is to do that, you have to have some mechanism. I use this mechanism because I can't think of a better mechanism to get a property of bankruptcy. Okay? So my issue is not with what they estimate as property of bankruptcy costs or bankruptcy. It's the fact that they don't even try to estimate it that I think leads me to to say, look, you know, if you're going to use the APV approach, you can't stop for the A and P. You got to bring in the V. Otherwise, I'm not sure what you're getting. You're two thirds of the way, and you missed the biggest cost of borrowing money. Okay. So the op optimal debt ratio in this case turns out to be 14. You know, relative to what you know Zach was saying, it makes me feel better about my cost of capital, even though it's completely arbitrary. If I change that bankruptcy cost from 25% of firm value to 40%, the optimal will drop back down to 30 or 20%. But it, you, maybe that's where I started and then I went to 25 to get the same answer. You'll never know, right? But that'll be just, you know, but the APB approach doesn't always have to give you the same optimal as the cost of capital approach, but it'll be, it'll be relatively close if you do it fully. Which brings us to, so we've talked about the cost of capital approach, the enhanced cost of capital approach, the APV approach, which brings me to the way 80% of companies choose how to borrow money. So all of this talk we've had about optimizing debt applies to 20% of companies that actively think about, do we have enough debt? The unfortunate truth remains that there are two forces in corporate finance that are inexorable. One is inertia. Why do you do what you do? Because that's what we've always done. The other is me tooism. Why do you do what you do? Because everybody else is doing it. I know it sounds unscientific, but the way most companies decide how much to borrow is they look at what companies in their peer group, and that's already a subjective statement, do, and they try to stay as close as they can to their peer group. And I understand it. Me Tooism is as strong as it is because of the survival instinct. What I mean by that is if you borrow a lot of money and everybody else in your peer groups borrow, also borrows a lot of money and you, and you get into trouble, you all get into trouble at the same time. And your response is, don't pick on me. I just did what everybody else was doing. So much as we'd like to may have companies make choices on debt based on what they can afford to borrow, the truth is, they're constantly looking over their shoulder, looking around saying, what is everybody else doing? So if you ever have to work with a company on an optimal debt ratio and you've done everything right, you've done the cost of capital, you put in enhancements, you come up with an optimal. You can say, you tell the CFO, your optimal debt ratio is 30%. You know, the first question the CFO is going to ask you, right? If I go to the 30%, will I look strange? Basically, will that make me an outlier? Because the answer is, it will make you an outlier. They won't do it. 
So whether you like it or not, you have to compare or bring in the peer group. And here's where I think we need some finesse. The way we bring in the peer group often is by bringing in the average. On average, debt ratios for technology companies is 7%. On average, debt ratios for chemical companies is 23%. But let's face it, that's an average across lots of companies. Very different from your company and very different across each other. And given what we know about what drives debt, there should be differences across those companies, even within the same sector. Based on what? If some of your companies face higher tax rates than other companies in your list, they should have higher debt ratios. If some of your companies have less insider ownership, they should have higher debt ratios. Remember the less insider ownership you have, the added discipline argument kicks in. If, you're, if some of your companies have more stable income than other companies, they should, they should have much higher debt ratios. And if, you, if some of your companies are more intangible assets, that's an agency cost issue. So if nothing else, even within a peer group, you should see differences. But let's see how our companies look relative to their peer group. So what I've done here is I've taken Disney, Vale, Tata Motors, and Baidu. I've listed out four variants in the debt ratio. You're saying why we're looking at four? Because once we look at, decide that we're going to be like the peer group, all the rules about how to compute debt ratio get thrown out of the window, right? You can use book debt ratios. We can use market debt ratios. You can look at debt to equity, debt to capital, net debt, gross debt. There's no right or wrong here. It's whatever you've decided to compare yourself on. And when you look across the four companies, it's remarkable how close these companies are to the industry average. Now, the numbers might look different, but when you look at Disney, for instance, 23%, you know, take the market value, 11.6%, 15.4%. And if you think within the range of entertainment companies, 11.58% comes very close to the median for the value. At least at first look, these companies all look like they have roughly the, I think the exception might be Tata Motors, which looks over levered relative to the typical automobile company. And we talked about why that might be happening. Baidu has very low debt ratios, but so does everybody else in, this, in the global online advertising business. It looks to me like if you think of the driving force as to why these companies do what they do, it's because they want to be pretty close to where the industry is. Now, but I wanted to refine this a little bit more. So here's what I did. You know, I said, look, I have the debt ratios for 50 companies in my sector. Right now, I'm just using the average, but that's almost criminal, right, in terms of data. You take the average, you throw everything else out. Think of how much data you've thrown out. What if I took the 50 companies in my sector and looked at why debt ratios vary across companies as a function of the things I think should matter? The tax rate, how variable the earnings are, and how much cash they generate as a company. Let's say I ran this regression across the companies in my sector. I'm going to come up with the regression equation based on the peer group. I'm still staying with the peer group, where if you tell me your tax rate, how variable your earnings are, and what your EBIT does as a person of firm value, I should be able to give you a pure group adjusted debt ratio for your company. So rather than looking at just the average, I mean, for Disney in particular, I had to do this because you look at Disney versus the rest of the entertainment sector. I think it was Disney and Warner and everybody else was this tiny, small, you know, makes three films every two years kind of company. So I wanted to control for that. Question. Oh, we're going back to the APV approach. Okay. Because that won't give you an unlevered firm value. It'll give you an un a levered equity value, which is not the same thing as an unlevered firm value. Same problem, right? Because a levered equity value will reflect the tax benefits from debt, right? So if you're an equity investor and you get a lot of tax benefits from debt, your equity value will be higher. So even if the market is 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 fully pricing that in, your levered equity value will then have the tax benefits of debt built in. Okay, so that's why you you have to almost ask a hypothetical. You have to go back to unlevered cash flow, discount back an unlevered cost of equity. So basically, this is an extension of the peer group approach. So let's try this. You know, 
Tata Motors looked like it was over levered relative to the typical automobile company. So I got 56 auto companies in my sector. I ran a regression of the debt to capital of these companies against the effective tax rate. The reason I had to say with the effective tax rate, basically, is I wanted to get a sense of are these companies already, you know, if you're paying 3% effective taxes, I'm going to argue that you have less benefits coming from debt. If I use the marginal tax rate, there's almost no variation across companies. So I use the effective tax rate. I looked at EBITDA as a person of enterprise value. What does that measure? How much cash you have available to service debt and how much these companies need as CapEx, measuring how much they value financial flexibility. The regression R squared is nothing to write home about, 18.5%. Each of the coefficients was statistically significant. There's a lot of variation across debt ratios I cannot explain, but that's a problem with the peer group approach, right? Because when you use the average, you're hiding that variability. I'm just facing up to and say, there's a lot of variation here. And if I plug in Tata Motors numbers into that regression equation, 25.2% effective tax rate, 11.6% EBITDA as a person of enterprise value, and how much CapEx they had, my predicted debt ratio for Tata Motors, given how all the other automobile companies are borrowing, is about 18.5%. They were at 29.3%. 20, you know, so even after I adjust for differences, it still looks like Tata Motors is over level. Justin? Yeah, so basically, what does, so what does it mean when an R squared is low? No, but in terms of predictions, what does it, where does it show up? I get a predicted value of 18.5%. When I have 100% R squared, my predicted value will be perfect. As my R squared, so rather than think of R squares as high or low, think of them in terms of prediction range. The prediction range you come up with because the R squared is low is about 11 to 26%. The range is pretty large, but I'm outside the range still, right? 29%. So when you have low R squares, take them as what they are rather than try to fight it and say, no. So don't make it a zero one. I will not use a regression. The R squared is low and I will use it when it's high. Use the regression anyway. Build that low R squared into your predictive range. Because the range is so wide, you might end up not being able to reject the hypothesis your company has too little or too much debt. And since I could do this for a sector, I said, why can't I do this for the entire market? And this is something, if you go to my website, it has a 2023 version of this number. I take every company, and I do this for both US and global companies now. I take the debt to cap ratio for every company. And now because I have a lot more companies in my sample, I can afford to have a lot more independent variables as well. So I throw in the tax rate. I throw in the number of shares held by institutions to capture that agency cost issue. I look at the standard deviation operating income to measure how variable earnings are and how much these companies have as cash flows. You throw that in, I get a regression. And, and again, the R squared is 8%. I won't defend it. It's a, it is what it is. There's a lot of variation in debt ratios across companies that you cannot explain with fundamentals. It's a reason I would never try to go to a peer group average because God knows what's in that peer group average, right? But to the extent that you insist, if nothing else, it'll hold a mirror up to managers who want to be close to peer groups saying, you can have a peer group average, but look at the numbers, look at the range, or look at how much variability there's across entertainment companies. Do you really want to target an average when there's that much noise? Okay. Any questions? So I actually took that market regression I ran, plugged the numbers for Disney into that regression. The predicted debt ratio I get for Disney based on that regression is about 19% debt. Given how other U.S. companies are borrowing money, setting debt capacity, Disney should be at about 19% debt. And I'll remind you again, they're at 12% debt. The 19% is far lower than the 40% we got with the optimal approaches, but it's still higher than their actual debt ratio. So basically, all these approaches are not equal. Right? The pure group approach is much noisier because you're trying to base how much you borrow based on what other key companies are borrowing. And most sectors, there's a huge variation across companies, you know, depending on multitude of factors, many of which have nothing to do with fundamentals. So this is a page that I you know that Zach was leading up to, which is you have all these different approaches. What the heck do I do with all of them? 
let's take each of my companies. Let's take Disney. There are there's their actual debt ratio, eleven point six percent. You know, uh, the operating income approach we didn't even go through, but basically it's how much can my operating income drop before things blow up. You know, but every optimal debt ratio that I computed, including the industry averages, where I still get lower numbers, is higher than where they are today. My conclusion for Disney is I don't care which approach you want to go down. Every approach you use tells me that you have too little debt. If you want to go to 20% and say, that's where I'm comfortable because that's where the industry is, I'm okay with that. You're moving in the right direction. Okay? If you look at Vale, 35.48%, you know, the range of debt ratios pretty much put them where they should be, 26, 30, 35. So there my conclusion is, hey, you're, you're about where you should be in terms of debt ratios, just let it be. If you look at Tata Motors, higher than every approach suggested. No matter how you slice it, it looks like Tata Motors has too much debt. I understand you're borrowing money using TCS's debt capacity, but that is not a healthy way to run a standalone publicly traded company. And they can do whatever they want with that information, but to me, they look over levered. And finally, if you look at Baidu, you know, there is, you know, you look at the APB approach, it says they can borrow money, but all the other approaches crunch up around 10%. And remember, 10% basically means the optimal is between zero and 10. And at 5.23%, you might be at, at the optimal right now. So the two ex two companies that look like outliers are Disney looks like it has too much debt. Tata Motors looks like it has uh, too little debt. And Tata Motors looks like it has too much debt. The other three companies look like they should be where they should be, including Bookscape, which is at 27. The optimal is 30. Any questions? Yes. The, the market in this one was just US. You know? Today, I have a global as well. So if you want to really make this even and add another layer, relative to other US companies, relative to other global companies, remember, you are ultimately the decision maker here, right? None of these approaches puts you at the optimal. You ultimately get to decide. I want to give you as much. My objective is not to get you to borrow more money. That's not my objective. My objective is to get you to borrow money if it makes sense for you. Because it's your company. You got to run it for your shareholders. I want to give you as much ammunition as you can for making that. I don't see how doing an extra approach makes you worse off, right? Because it gives you more, more to base your decision on. So I think it makes sense to do as many of these approaches as you can to see what you can afford to borrow. Yeah. That's my next, that's my next point. First is, how quickly can you get to your optimal? Can you do it overnight? Absolutely. You know what you have to do? Borrow money and buy back stock, right? How much time does it take? In two months, I can move your debt ratio from zero to 50%. But that's like dropping from 300 pounds to 120 pounds in a month. That's not great, right? I mean, your body is going to do all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's, it's putting your company through shock therapy. If you can afford to, would you rather take more time? Absolutely. You know why? Because at each step, you can stop and say, am I moving in the right direction? You'll collect more information. Maybe you shouldn't be at 40. Maybe you should be at 20 or 30. So if time is your ally, you'd like to take more time. And we'll talk about the ways you can get to the optimal. But you're going to discover that in some cases, time is not your ally. You've got to do something. You've got to do something quickly. We'll look at what the trigger for that is. So now we have this mix, whether we're going to use it or not. The question is, what do we know next? So here's what I'm going to start with. Let's assume that a week from now, you computed the optimal debt ratio of your company. I'm being optimistic. Let's, you know, let me stay being optimistic. You have your actual, you have your optimal. One of three things is going to be true for your company. The first is your company is already close to its optimal. In which case, what should you do? Follow the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, okay? The reason I emphasize that sometimes consultants are called in and they feel the urge to ask the company to do things, even if it doesn't, because they say, you know, otherwise they'll think I'm useless. If a company is at its optimal, say congratulations, move on. But let's take the two other scenarios. It could be under levered or it can be over levered. Which is a better problem to have? To have too little debt or too much debt? Too little debt. Play, pray and hope that your company has too little debt. The choices become so much more attractive. 
And then once you've done that, the next step is first determining whether to move to the optimal. Remember, that choice is still yours. None of these approaches automatically move you there, determining whether to move to the optimal. And maybe you might choose not to. We'll talk about what might hold you back. Okay? And if you decide to move to the optimal, whether you want to do it quickly or whether you want to do it gradually. And finally, if you decide to do it gradually, what are the different ways in which you can raise your debt ratio over time? So let's fill out those details. Whenever I finish the optimal debt ratio for a company, I go through a flow chart. And this is only for those companies which are either under levered or over levered. The correctly levered companies, no need for a flow chart. So let's take the, easy, the better prompt app. You're under levered. The first question I'm going to ask you is, are you potentially under threat of a takeover? Why would having too little debt make you a much better target for a takeover? Sorry? Who's, let's be specific. So who has the capacity to use what debt? But the company uses it, the person doesn't. The acquirer uses your debt capacity to borrow money and buy you out. This is the ultimate insult, right? I mean, I'll give you the analogy. It doesn't work with the analogy, and thank God for it. Let's suppose you buy a house in the tri-state area. It's going to cost you a couple of million for a hovel. And unless you're a drug dealer, you've got to borrow money to buy the house. So you take 30-year mortgage. You got this house and every month you pay not just the mortgage payment, you pay more because you're a prudent person and you want. So six years in, you now own the only all equity financed house in your neighborhood. And you have a party, a mortgage burning party. In the old days, there used to be a day when you paid your final mortgage, you had a mortgage burning party where you physically burned the mortgage papers. Once in a while, you'd burn your house down with it, but it's, I know it's beyond ironic when that happened. So you decide to have a mortgage burning party. You invite all your neighbors and the neighborhood firemen too, just in case. And your neighbor, Joe, has never really liked you. He doesn't like the way you cut your lawn, the way you do your shrubs. He just doesn't like you. He comes too. Why? It's free food. And while he's sitting there eat, drinking your orange juice and eating your coffee cake, he's plotting his revenge. So right after the party is done, does what he does. He goes to the neighborhood banker. Remember, this is a small town. The banker knows him. He says, hi, Joe. And he says, look, I'd like to borrow money on my neighbor's house. This is where the analogy usually breaks down, right? You walk into a bank and say, I'd like to borrow money in my neighbor's house. The banker is probably going to say, it's not your house. But let's say this is your friendly neighborhood banker. He says, whose house is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can borrow money on that house. So what he does is he borrows $1.8 on your $2 million house, which is no, $1.6 million if he wants to be conservative. And then he does a leveraged buyout of your house, a hostile acquisition of your house. I'm not even sure how this would work in a house, but maybe you've given your kids shares and they sell you out. What enough money. So before you know it, your neighbor now, Joe, Joe now owns your house. He throws you out. This cannot happen with a house, but let's talk about a company. You're the CEO of a $2 billion publicly traded company that can afford to have a billion and a half in debt. You've chosen not to borrow money. Why? Because you're a conservative CEO. I see the company and I play out exactly what Joe did with the house. I walk to a bank and say, I'd like to borrow money against this company. He says, is it your company? No, it's somebody else's company. And that's where the game would have ended in 1980 or 81. You could not borrow on somebody else's company until Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham created a market. What's a market that Drexel Burnham created that did not exist? High yields have always existed or Junk bonds have always existed, but they allowed for original issue high yield market. Until the 80s, the way you became junk was you started investment grade and you slid. Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham created a market where you could be double B rated and actually issue bonds. Until 1980, the 80s, you could not do that. So here's what you do. You're the potential acquirer. You see this $2 billion company, you issue 
junk bonds. Why? Because there's nothing securing your bond. So the people buying your bond know you don't own the company. You tell them, look, I plan to use the, this debt to acquire the company. If you have enough of a track record, they will lend you the money. Maybe at a rating that reflects the fact that you have nothing to back it up. You use that debt to fund a predominant part of the acquisition. And if you're a conservative CEO, in addition to not borrowing money, what have you very conveniently accumulated within the company to make my life easy as an acquirer? Cash. So I borrow money using your company's debt capacity. I buy your company with that money. Then I use your cash to pay off the debt. I borrowed using your... It can't get any sweeter than this if you're an acquirer, right? You've just greased the skids. So if you're under lever, the first question I'm going to ask you is, are you potentially the threat of a hostile acquisition? Now, don't go looking at the Wall Street Journal. No, I, I don't see my name yet. Okay. If you're, you know, let's look at some of the characteristics that will make you potentially a target. Microsoft is under lever. Is it a potential target of a hostile acquisition? Tell me what's going to stop you. Two and a half trillion dollars, right? That's a lot of money. The threshold has risen over time. It used to be that if you're more than 10 billion people who try, that's risen to 50, 80, 100, but two and a half trillion is a little beyond people's reach. So the first thing you're going to look at is the size of a company. Smaller and mid-sized companies in terms of market cap are more likely to be targets. Second, let's take a company that is smaller, mid-sized. It's a hundred billion, it's, it's a ten billion dollar company. You could potentially do it, right? But then you notice that the founder is still CEO of the company and owns 23% of the shares. That could be a problem because you have to buy 51% of the remaining 77%. So the second thing that's going to drive whether you become a hostile acquisition target is what percent of the shares are controlled by the insiders who run the company. And there's a third element. And this we kind of mentioned early in the class. Every hostile acquisition is a fight between two sides. On the one side is the incumbent management. The other side is a hostile acquirer and you are the shareholders in the middle. And they're both seeking your attention and your approval, right? So what do the incumbent managers tell you about the hostile acquirer? Terrible person. He's going to ruin the company. Don't trust him. And what's the acquirer telling you about the incumbent managers? They don't care about you. They live in big houses. They bought Ferraris. They, you know, your stock. And what tips the scales here is how well or badly your stock has performed in the recent past, after adjusting for risk and what the market, does that sound familiar? How well or badly your stock has performed? I mean, is there something we already estimated that captures that? Remember the Jensen's Alpha we computed? We kind of did that it's in the context of something very different. So here's the trifecta. You're a smaller, mid-sized company with very little insider holdings, and you have a negative Jensen's Alpha, big negative Jensen's Alpha. You don't need to look at the Wall Street Journal. You are potentially in the, under threat of a takeover, and you've got to do something quickly. And there are two ways. You can raise your debt ratio quickly. One is to do what's called a recap. You borrow money, and you buy back stock. What does that do? It raises your debt ratio, lowers your equity. You can do this essentially over a, over a few weeks and essentially go from zero to 40%. You might have to hire an investment banker to carry this through, but basically you, can. It, you just borrow money and buy back stock. It's called a recapitalization. There's a version, of, there's a second version, especially if you're a small company. It's called a debt for equity swap. You know what a swap is, right? Basically you have something, I swap it with your equivalent market value. In a debt for equity swap, here's what I do. I go to the equity investors in my company and offer them an equivalent amount of debt. You're saying, why would they take it? Maybe they were planning to sell your stock and buy bonds anyway. That's why this has got to be a smaller company. Either way, you've essentially moved from where you are. And you can do it over a period of weeks. You know that 85% of recaps are in response to a hostile acquisition bid. It's not like managers waking up and say, oh my God, I have debt capacity, let me use it. It's because they're afraid that if they don't do it, the acquirer will do it to them. And it's the right thing to do. Why leave that for the acquirer to claim the tax benefits when you can claim it for your own stockholders? So that's if you have to do something quickly. Alternatively, 
you can wait. Why? Because you're too large a firm, you have insider holdings, you have voting shares, you've created, this is where your corporate governance assessment of your company can come and say, hey, my company can't be taken over. It's got voting and non-voting shares. You have time as your ally. If time is your ally, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. I'm going to ask you, do you have good projects? It's a stupid question, right? When you ask this of a company, what's every company going to say? Yes, of course, we have great projects, but I'm not going to take you at your word. I have a statistic I can look at where I can say, hey, you know what? This number doesn't agree with you. And here again, I'm going to draw on a session from way past. Remember when we computed return on capital for companies we compared to the cost of capital? For Disney, we came up with 12.61% of the return on capital, higher than the cost of capital of 7.81%. For better or worse, we said, it looks like you're making 4.8% more than your cost of capital. It's a noisy, it's a it's a device with limitations, but it's a, it's a number in front of me. So when you tell me of great projects, I'm gonna look at it and say, then how do you explain the fact that you've been making a 3% return on capital for the last 10 years? If you have good projects, you can earn more than your cost of capital. Then my advice to you is use the debt capacity to take those projects. You get a double whammy. The first is by moving to the optimal, you lower your cost of capital, you raise your value. But what's the definition of a good project in capital budgeting? What does it bring with it? Positive NPV. And what do we say happens to a company when it takes projects with positive NPV? It goes up. So when you borrow money to take a good project, you get the improvement in value from going to your optimal. In a world where you have good projects, I would rather that you use the debt capacity to take the good projects. And over time, here's what's going to happen. It's not like your equity goes down, but your debt will increase over time. Your firm value will go up and your debt ratio will go up. If you don't have good projects, then we're much more constrained. So you you have time as your ally. You don't have good projects. You want to increase your debt ratio. First, if you're paying dividends, just stop, right? I'm sorry, increase your dividends, basically, because you want to make your equity lower. Pay special dividends, supplement with a few stock buybacks. Do it over time rather than all at one time. So under levered firm, if you're under threat of a takeover, do something quickly. You have no choice. If you have time as your ally and you have good projects, fund those projects with debt. You get a higher NPV and a higher debt ratio. But if you don't have good projects, pay more in dividends, buy back a little stock every year, and over time, your debt ratio will go up. Any questions? So that's if you're under level. Let's take the more difficult problem. What if you're over level? What if you have too much debt? I mean, right now, I've talked about Thames Water. You know? Yes. It's a question of mutual, it has to be mutually acceptable. Either way, you get the same outcome, right? As a company, when I replace equity with debt, I, I have the higher debt ratio, which is my end game. The question is whether you as a shareholder want to go along with it because you it's got to be voluntary, right? So when I offer you, the reason you might go along with, let's say you, were plan, you, you think you have too much equity in your portfolio as an investor. You were planning to reduce your equity anyway and buy bonds to replace it. This is a costless way you can get there without having to go through the process. That's why it works only if you're a relatively small company. As you get bigger, it's going to be more difficult to make this voluntary. You have to do a debt for equity, you know, borrow money and buy back stock, which is more involved because now investment bankers will have to get involved. There'll be an issuance cost. You know, maybe you have to file with the SEC. So there might be more involved with that. But if you have the choice and you can do a debt for equity swap, I would do it every single time. Yeah. And maybe you can start with that. Maybe you can get a little bit of the way with just a swap. You, basically, it'll be an offer to this. So, you know, what you do is you offer every one of your shareholders, look, we're planning to borrow money. And if you have equity in the company, you can turn in your shares and we will give you an equivalent amount of debt in market value terms. So you own $100,000 my equity, you'll end up with $100,000 in my bonds. So let's look at the more difficult scenario. You have too much debt. What do you need to do? You need to bring your debt ratio down. So give me some, some ideas. You have too much debt as a company. What are some of the things you might try to do? And I'm going to act like a, you know, a skunk at the party and try to shoot them down because that's the way the world will behave when you're an over-levered company. So any ideas? You have too much debt as a company. What's the first thing? 
you can issue shares, right? So play it through. You 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 announce you're issuing shares. What's the problem you're going to run into? What's every news story that's been about you for the last three, last few months? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Now you're issuing shares. People are going to say, well, you crazy. I'm not touching your shares, right? So it is true. You want to raise equity, but it's not easy to issue shares if you're over levered and everybody thinks you're over levered. You don't have the cash to pay preferred dividend. You're just replacing one headache with an even bigger headache, right? Now, you might not default now, but you might not have the cash to turn over to the preferred stockholders. Yep. One is, I mean, that, that's normal advice you're given, right? Sell assets. Play it through, though, Gandhar, when you try to sell assets and everybody knows you're in trouble and you need the cash quickly, what's your bargaining position going to look like? It's going to look like crap. So you take a, you think you have an asset worth a hundred million, and I am on the other side of the table. I'll offer you ten million. You say that's absurd. Ten million and nothing. You think about it and say, I'll take the ten million. It's amazing what people will take when they believe that the alternative is nothing. You no, know, one of my favorite examples of what lenders will take is uh, from the 1800s in Latin America. Latin America then was had a lot of debt, was defaulting. You're saying, what's different about Latin America now? It was 1800s versus, you know, it's the same problem kind of playing out in reverse. So late 1800s, I forget which Latin American country borrows money from a French bank. And it's unable to make its interest payments. So the French bank says, you know, your interest payments are due, so we don't have the money. Would you accept bird droppings instead? No, I'm not kidding. Guano, basically. You know, it's a good fertilizer. You know, we can send you shiploads of bird droppings. The bank said, we don't take bird droppings. We're a bank. They said, well, you can take bird droppings or nothing. You know what? The bank took the bird droppings. You sound, But, you know, when you're desperate, you will essentially take. And this is why your bargaining position as a borrower is maximized just before you go bankrupt. Because you know, once you go bankrupt, exactly where you're going to end up, right? The legal system, you won't see your money for 20 years. You're essentially using it. Sounds mildly or significantly unethical. Hey, but you got to survive and you're going to do whatever you can to survive. So if you're on your last legs, it's tough to sell assets, tough to issue stock. So you try to negotiate the best terms you can in a restructuring. You can come out of the other side, at least with something intact. But that's if you have to do something quickly. How do you know you're, you know, you've got too much debt? You could be too much debt and be a surviving operating com company. How do you know if you have, when you have too much debt that you have that? your demise might be imminent. You just know it, right? Your bills are not being paid, you're shuffling. I mean, in a sense, everybody in a company like that involved with the cash flows knows that it's only a matter of time if something doesn't get done. It's like walking, I mean, you go into a company like that, it's like walking into a funeral home. You remember in some companies, they used to have the stock price in the front, that's no longer there. It's like how many days to doomsday kind of clock running, right? 23 days, 22 days until our next cash flow comes to you. So if you have to do something quickly, you're going to do everything you can to try to extract yourself. However, if you have no bankruptcy threat hovering over you, and another way to say if you have bankruptcy threat, just check your rating. If you're triple C rated, don't say, am I under bankruptcy? You are under bankruptcy threat. Otherwise, you wouldn't be triple C rated. You got to do something quickly. But if you don't, if you're not under bankruptcy threat, and there are over levered companies, and many of you are working with companies that might be over levered, but have no immediate worry about bankruptcy, again, time is your ally, right? There again, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you when you had when you had you know excess debt capacity. Do you have good projects? The answer is yes. You should fund those projects disproportionately with equity. You think, but I can't issue shares. Remember, you have time as your ally. What's the most common way in which companies find equity reinvest? Retained earnings. So stop paying dividends. A distressed company that continues to pay dividends, it's out of its mind. And I see companies like those because, again, inertia, we've always paid dividends. Just stop. We'll send the wrong signal. 
in what universe are you worried about signaling that you're in trouble? Everybody knows you're in trouble. Stop paying dividends, put all the equity in, and over time, you get the best way of getting out of a debt problem, which is you grow out of it. Your equity rises over time because these projects pay off. So when you look at a company, basically take it through the process. So I took Disney through the process, at least in 2013. Is it under levered? Yes. 12%, whether it's 20 or 30 or 40%, it's clearly under levered. Is it under threat of a takeover? At least in 2013, my answer was no. But remember, this is the fourth time I've done Disney. I've gone back and forth on it. The first year time I did Disney in 1997, I said, not a threat of a takeover. My second edition was in 2003. You know what happened between 1997 and 2003 at Disney? Its stock price halved. And it had the most hated CEO on the face of the earth running it, Michael Eisner. And I said, you know what? You could be taken over. In fact, a year later, Comcast tried a hostile acquisition of Disney. 2009, my third edition, go back to, you know, by then, Bob Iger was essentially viewed as this great corporate governance guy. But if I did this in 2023, I'm back to being shaky. You see, who could buy Disney? Lots of companies could buy. Apple could buy Disney with cash, petty cash. Send the guy out, buy Disney and bring it back to me, right? Okay. It's no longer too large to be taken over. And if you imagine a company with the, with Disney's content, could be incredibly attractive tech company that says, look, we want to enter the entertainment space. This is not a one and done. It's something that you repeat and at different points, you get a different lens. In 2013, as I said, not likely it. It's Jensen's Alpha look good. Remember the Jensen's Alpha we got was 9% each year in the five years leading in. Positive Jensen's Alpha, excess returns were positive. Things look good. In 2013, I wouldn't have given a blank check, but I've told Disney, look, you have great investment plans. You have excess debt capacity. Use the debt capacity to take those projects. So as you assess your company, you have to make these judgments along the way. Once you get to under levered or over levered, do I have time as my ally? Do I have time against me? Because that's going to determine how quickly or slow you move through the process. Hopefully that answered your question about you know, how quickly or slowly you move through. So try to complete that part of the process because it'll close off that, you know, do I have excess debt capacity? What do I do next? In fact, one of the ways you can tell when companies are getting worried about takeovers is managers will start to talk about shareholders and how much they care about shareholders, deathbed conversions. But usually when you see CEOs talk about how much they care about shareholder wealth maximization and how much they care about stockholders, you know that something's lighting the fire under that. You know, I remember about uh, 20 years ago, you know, I was at a European corporate governance panel. And if you know Europe through much of the last century, you know, mainland Europe, not the UK, mainland Europe, there was no threat of a hostile acquisition. Companies could not be acquired through hostile means. Why? Because in those days, European bond markets were not developed. So the way you had to borrow money was to borrow from a European bank. Imagine going to an Italian bank, say, I'd like to borrow money. I want to do a leverage buyout of fiat. Good luck with that, right? Because the bank said, no, I'm not lending you money to buy an Italian institution. In the late 90s, there's this, there was this Italian company called Telecom Italia. At that time, you know, it was a monopoly that, that basically dealt with telecom. was acquired in a hostile acquisition. Why? Because the bond markets had finally opened. And it shocked European CEOs. They said the barbarians have entered our continent. Now, you know, we're not safe anymore. So... Two years later, they called this panel because you and you know the room was full of European CEOs, all wanting to be reassured that the barbarians were not coming after them. I happen to be on the panel. I hate panels because you have to be silent while other people talk. And so the CEO of Siemens was in the panel. He gets up and he says, At Siemens, we care deeply about shareholders. And I almost fell out of my chair. A company where you know shareholders have been treated like mosquitoes for a century, where you pay them a dividend and say, just go away. I mean, listening to the guy talk about shareholder wealth was like listening to Madonna sing like a virgin. Which my reaction is, how do you know? Uh, 
So when you think about shareholder wealth maximization, it might seem like a slam dunk, but when managers talk about it, it's a sign that they're worried. So when you think about you know, the mechanics of changing debt ratios, it's actually very simple. You have a few levers. Yeah? It, to decrease the debt ratio, you can sell operating assets. I'm sorry, did I do the increase? To decrease the debt ratio, you can sell operating assets, use the cash to pay down the debt. To increase the debt ratio, you can sell assets and buy back stock, right? Basically, you know, everything. And think of this not as a financial balance sheet, but uh, not as an accounting balance sheet, but as a financial balance sheet. If you issue new stock to retire debt, that basically increase, uh, uh, the, the, you, reduces your debt ratio. But if you borrow money and buy back stock, it increases your debt ratio. So think about all the mechanisms you have under your control. And dividends, of course, reduce equity. And over time, if you pay enough dividends, you can increase your debt ratio. All those mechanisms have to come into play and push in the same direction. You want to have a higher debt ratio, make sure that all those mechanisms are pushing in that so you don't have to overcome something pushing in the other direction. So if you're going to do debt ratios changing gradually over time, the mechanisms I would suggest, you know, use dividends, do short talk buybacks, no, and if you're if you're trying to reduce debt, debt repayments over time using again retained earnings to pay down the debt over time. But those mechanisms are available only if your time is your ally. You can't develop ten-year plans if people are pushing on you to change something quickly. Okay? No. Along the way, one of the tricky things about doing this adjustment over time is if I ask you to go from a ten percent to a forty percent debt ratio today. Relatively simple, right? The firm value stays the same. So I take 10% and we will do four. But if you want to go from 10% to 40% over time, remember your firm value will change over time because there's an expected price appreciation. It's trickier mechanically, but the end game is the same. But a 40% optimal debt ratio, if you're going to do it over 10 years, will usually lead to a much higher dollar debt at the end of 10 years than doing it today because you're just going to be looking at a larger company. But the levers stay the same, the mechanics stay the same. Essentially, it's just a little more involved when you're going to do it gradually over time. So we've talked about the right mix of debt and whether you want to get there and how quickly. Let's complete the story and the financing principle. The basic core idea when you design debt is you want to design debt that looks and behaves like equity. Think about why. What's the biggest advantage of borrowing? It's a tax advantage. What's the biggest advantage of using equity? It's a flexibility, right? Bad times. You know. What if I could design debt that behaves like equity? In other words, you get the tax benefits of debt and you get the flexibility. It seems like too good to be true, but let's try. Okay? Essentially, you're designing debt where the cash flows and the debt move up and down with the cash flows of the firm. Let me give you, give you a default risk perspective why designing match debt is good for you as a company. Let's suppose you have a company that takes debt that remains constant. The cash flows remain the same no matter what the company is doing. So the firm value goes up and down. Think of it as a commodity company. Every time the firm value drops below the debt, you're technically bankrupt. I could put you out of business. It's risky, right? But if I take the same company and it borrows money that moves up and down with the debt, and we'll talk about the mechanics of doing it, you can borrow more money than the previous company and never face default. That's the end game. You're trying to design debt that looks and behaves like equity. So let's go through the process of debt design. And this is a process where I think companies make the mistake of turning it over to bankers. Is it because they say bankers know about all the different debt issues? Why don't you tell us what the right kind of debt for us is? Ultimately, to design the perfect debt, you've got to understand your business. And let's face it, no banker should understand your business better than you do, because if they do, you're in big trouble. You are in the best position to design the best debt for your company. So you're a company, and I want to design the perfect debt. I'm going to have a series of questions about your company's projects. And as you answer them, I'm designing the perfect debt. First, I'm going to ask you, tell me a typical project. Is it long term or is it short term? Let's take two contrasting examples, Boeing versus Dell. What's a typical project for Boeing? 15 years of R&D, then 20 years of delays. No, that's that's new. Huh? But you set up this big construct. The old Boeing, if you ever have a chance and drive by the old Boeing, the, the 
manufacturing facilities, they're like four football fields big. I mean, huge manufacturing. So take five or 10 years to set up. And once you start producing the aircraft, if it's decent, you get 25 or 30 years. The last Boeing 737, 747, the original jumbo jet, rolled off 37 years after the first one. Start to finish, typical project is 50, 60 years. What's the right kind of debt for for Boeing in terms of in terms of in terms of maturity? It should be really long term debt. Boeing was one of two companies to issue hundred year corporate bonds. It's a long time ago, twenty years ago. The other was Disney. They will talk about whether it makes sense for Disney, but for Boeing it does. In contrast, let's take a typical project for Nvidia. Okay, a new chip for a new market three, four years of research, right? Then you produce the chip and the market kind of runs its course over five years, the gaming and the, so essentially looking at six, seven, eight years. We can debate whether it's five years or eight years, but the typical debt for NVIDIA should be shorter term because its projects are shorter term. So first question is, what's the typical project for you? Second, I'm going to ask you, what currency do your cash flows and your project come in on? Let's take Boeing again. It's a tricky company because it sells its aircraft to different airlines. And depending on the airline, its cash flows can be in Singaporean dollars. It can be in Malaysian ringgit. Basically, you can go down and you're going to get different currencies. I need to know the mix of contracts you have. And if I'm designing the right debt, I want to get a debt that reflects that mix. In contrast, if you're looking at a company that gets all its revenues in the US, I want the debt to be dollar debt, no matter how much you tell me about foreign currency debt. Third, I'm going to ask you, tell me how inflation plays out in your company. Let me be specific. I mean, we're in a period, especially in the last three years, where inflation has gone up and down. And one of the questions that people have asked is, is this good for companies? Is this bad or neutral? Under what conditions can inflation be neutral to you as a company? What, you know, take me through the, the, the pieces of the company and tell me, first, tell me the bad news with inflation interest rates go up, your cost of capital goes up, right? The cost, of, so the discount rate is going to go up for everybody. So that's bad, right? Unless you can get an offsetting effect on your cash flows. In other words, you have to pass inflation through. What drives that? Pricing power. If you're a company with significant pricing power, here's what you're going to do. As inflation goes up, you're going to pass it through. How much are you paying for Air Amazon Prime now? 139. What did you take? Take your non-discretionary items: Netflix in 2020, Netflix today, Amazon Prime in 2020. And then, if you're asking how come these companies have not been hurt by inflation, there's your answer: they're passing things through. If you have pricing power, you can pass inflation through. In contrast, if you're a company without pricing power, inflation kills you. And here's why: you're not able to pass through inflation, but your costs are still rising you're going to get squeezed. If you're a company with pricing power can pass inflation through, you're a much better candidate for floating rate debt. You see why? Because as inflation rises, interest rates go up. You're in, if you're a company without pricing power, for God's sakes, don't issue floating rate debt, no matter how attractive it might look, you'll get squeezed at exactly the wrong time. Fourth, I'm going to ask you about growth patterns. Are you a mature company with relatively little growth in the future? Are you are you a company which is looking at a lot of growth in the future? Why does that matter? If you're a company that has a lot of expected growth in the future, I think you're a much better candidate for convertible debt. And here's why. If you're a company with low cash flows or even negative cash flows now, but you expect high growth in the future, the advantage of convertible debt is the coupon is low. Not because you're giving, you know, it's, it's a great deal for you, but because you're giving an equity option. And as you grow, your conversion will take care of converting debt to equity and you can replace with straight debt. Hey, we've designed 80% of debt issues right there. How long term, what currency, fixed or floating rate, straight or convertible debt. It all came from you telling me what your projects were, not me telling you the pluses and minuses of each. And then I'm going to ask you a final question. So is there anything else that affects your cash flows? Because you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to try to build into your debt. Let's say you're a gold mining company. It's the biggest single factor determining whether you have a good year or a bad year. Gold prices, right? Wouldn't it be neat if I could design a bond with the following feature? The coupon rate on the bond is tied to gold prices. 
If gold prices go up, you pay an 8% coupon. If gold prices go down, you pay a 3% coupon. So I'll specify, it'll be legally structured. Those bonds exist. In fact, the very those are called commodity bonds. The very first commodity bond was issued by a gold mining company in the early 1980s, where essentially the coupon rate. You're not trying to pull a fast one. You're effectively kind of passing the debt, the risk through, so you can borrow the money, claim the tax benefits still. So when you think about companies, you're trying to say, what else can affect? I'll leave you with one final example. Right? Let's say you're a small insurance company. And this actually comes from you know, somebody who used to be in this class who went to work for an insurance company. And she called me, she said, I did this optimal capital structure for my company. And I think they're significantly under levered. She said, okay, you know, they borrow 5%, they're at 30%. She said, and I said, what do you plan to do? She said, I plan to present this to the top management. I knew exactly what she was walking into, but I wanted her to walk in there and then come out and talk about it. And she, said, she goes in, a week later, she calls me, and she said, it did not go well. I said, what happened? She said, I told them they had optimal excess debt capacity. I said, what did they say? I said, we know, but we can't borrow money because we're always one disaster away from bankruptcy. You know what you're talking about, right? Small insurance company, you're overexposed to earthquakes or fires in California or, or, or hurricanes in Florida. One big event can wipe us out. So let me ask you a question. You're a small, I mean, small insurance company I have excess debt capacity. I can't borrow money because I'm worried about a potential disaster. Is there a way I could design my debt to be able to borrow money and not get into trouble in the event of a disaster? Yes. Or that's illegal. You throw yourself at the mercy of the court, right? I want something that actually functions on a going concern basis. You are to catastrophe bonds or cat bonds? Cat bonds are actually very unique. The bonds where you issue the bond, there's a coupon rate and a face value, but they come with a clause where in the event of a catastrophe, and lawyers actually write out what a catastrophe is, so it's not left to your you know, imagination. An earthquake that measures more than six on the Richter scale of you know hurricane that causes more than three billion damage, the company can legally suspend coupon payments for five years. In some cases, even reduce the principal payment. You think, why would I buy the catastrophe bond? Why would you buy the catastrophe bond if it comes with those clauses? Because you read the Farmer's Almanac this year and you convinced that there's no catastrophe coming and you're playing the game. Right? You get a much higher interest rate. Say, I've read the Farmer's Almanac, no hurricane this year. Okay. People think they're experts on all kinds of crap, right? No, I am an expert on how do you get the expertise? You're taking advantage of the human, the human capacity to overestimate its expertise in pretty much every area. And this pays out as a deal for you. So next session, when we start, we're going to actually design the bond. I want you to start thinking about this part for your company. What's a typical project for my company? Because that's 90% of debt design is to make sure you can create that. No, just do the optimal with, with that num. Right. Basically, after you've done the optimal, you have ratings at the bottom, right? Just how many knots is there? You can lower every rating of two knots. So basically, what that will do is we raise the cost of debt of everyone, every notch which will effectively change your optimal once you put that in. Exactly. In fact, there is an option there where I let you look at the last two. You know, so look at the last two questions I ask you. One of them might do what you, know, what, what you want, which is to, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.